Okay, everybody, we're back from Diana's farm, and today we're going to cook some rhubarb. So again, rhubarb is another vegetable that just screams spring. So last two weeks ago, we were talking about asparagus, and now it's rhubarb. And to be honest with you, most times using rhubarb, I think we need strawberries, because that's what everyone says. Strawberries and rhubarb, they belong together. But if that was the case, strawberries would be ripe now too, and they're not. So when I was asking Diana about rhubarb, she had suggested that she likes to make a chutney. Now that's something I've never done with rhubarb. We're always making something called a compote, where we cook it down with sugar. We might put it, generally it goes into a dessert. So I decided to look some up, get some ideas, and I came up with this recipe. So we're gonna make a simple chutney with rhubarb, sort of influenced with Indian spices, there's sugar, there's vinegar. Rhubarb seems to always need sugar. And I actually dug out this book, Rhubarb. Believe it or not, there's 120 pages of rhubarb recipes. Uh, so I'll have to read it later. Okay, so we wanna talk about the ingredients we're using. We mentioned rhubarb. So you saw at the farm how it's grown, how Diana will trim it up, clean off the leaves, and it's brought to us this way. And from here, we need to process it, cut it, sugar it, whatever we're doing. So for this recipe, we're gonna dice up the rhubarb, which we've already done. We have mustard seeds. We're using, obviously, sugar. We're using vinegar. We're using just the distilled white vinegar. We have some spices already ground. We're using a spice blend called Ra's Al Hanout. We have cardamom ground and ground cumin. We're using black cumin seed and crushed red pepper. Now, these are not ground. We want the seeds visible in the chutney. Both of these, also this seed is called um, nigella, but also referred to as black cumin. So a lot of these spices we get right up the street from not just spices, a great little Indian spice store. We're using crystallized ginger. You certainly can substitute fresh ginger, but I like the, the tang. Um, of the crystallized. We have bay leaf, we have cinnamon stick, of course, rhubarb. We've cut this up, we've washed it. Minced onion, now you notice that we have a little damp towel. It's a nice little trick. If you're doing all your mise en place, which is something we've discussed in other videos, you're getting all your ingredients together, you've cut up your onion. A damp towel over the onions helps mitigate the odor. Okay, and, and another reason why you might smell strong onion is a dull knife. So definitely dull knives um, crush the cells in the onions and it creates that odor. So a sharp knife is crucial. We have some minced garlic. Now again, this is a savory application. So we're using onions, garlic, there'll be a little salt and pepper, which is right here. And then again, we had mentioned just a distilled vinegar. So we have all our mise en place together. We're using blended oil for us for cooking. We use a canola olive oil blend. It's more economical. Uh, we're not using it for flavor necessarily. If we were, we'd use an extra virgin and I would never generally cook with an extra virgin. So a little bit of our blended oil. And we're gonna start by sweating the onions and garlic. Now sweating means to um, remove the moisture. You can do that by adding a little bit of salt, by covering it. Now I can see that my pan is nice and hot. So I'm gonna add the onions. Okay. And then I'm going to add a little bit of salt and just a little bit of black pepper. Now, if you notice how I'm holding my tongs, this was something that I learned when I worked for Gordon Hammersley at Hammersley's Bistro. It's something that has stayed with me for since I've worked there, and it's just a great technique to always have these right at hand. All the cooks here have to do it that way, and I think it's pretty cool. Probably any restaurant you go to, if you see that, you might think, hey, they work for Gordon. Okay, onions are in, they're sweating. Gonna lower the heat just a little bit. So a few minutes, it takes them to sweat. You can certainly cover them, which will definitely help keep them from taking too much color, putting out the moisture. After they've sweated for a little bit, we're gonna add our minced garlic. Okay. Now you always hear people talk, you cook to aroma. You don't know, what does that mean, cook to aroma? 
As soon as you add this garlic and it starts cooking, you can certainly smell the garlic. One thing you have to worry about, burnt garlic is really bitter. So you don't want to let it get too much color. So again, we're just going to stir this in. And now at this point, we're going to want to start toasting our spices. Okay, so this is where we're going to add our dried spices, our mustard seeds, our chili flake and the black cumin seeds and we're going to toast them in the pan. Now what this does is this brings out some of the oils in the spices and it really helps develop flavors. That's what this dish is all about. We're adding, we're developing, okay? So you can see this is getting just a little bit of color, just like this. And again, you wanna to try to keep the onions and the garlic off of the edges of the pan. You want everything to cook evenly. So just a little bit of color is great. And now we're gonna add our spices. So we have our ground spices. Again, that was the Ra's al Hanout, the cumin, and the cardamom. We're gonna dump those in. We're gonna add our mustard seeds. We're gonna add, and you really, well, you can't, but I can really smell it now, the black cumin seeds, the chili flake. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna stir this to start toasting the spices. Now, again, you can burn them, so you wanna be really careful. You can start to see Remember we've discussed in previous videos the fond, You're getting a little bit of fond building up on the bottom of the pan. When we add the sugar and eventually deglaze, that just adds flavor to our chutney, just like so. So now at this point, oh, it really smells great. I'm gonna add sugar. We wanna melt the sugar down first, then we're gonna add the rest of the ingredients. I feel like this is a really important step in making this chutney opposed to just adding all the ingredients in now and simmering them. So we're going to take our sugar and we're going to dump it in. And now at this point when we've done that, really pay attention to this pot. You want to stir it around and help dissolve that sugar. And if you remember from other videos, you can have the little pastry brush of water to help keep the edges of your pans clean. Okay, because you really want to get all that sugar dissolved and you do need to stir this. See how I'm cleaning off the bottom of the pan? You want to keep cleaning that pan because it will burn. It'll scorch. Okay, just like this. And I think this is really, really helping develop flavor in our chutney. Again, the way my mom would make this, everything would have gone in the pot and simmered. I just don't think the result is the same. You've got to take a little bit of time. So you can see now how it's starting to melt. Okay. And now this is a good time where I'm going to use that pastry brush to clean off the edges because I still see a little bit of sugar here that hasn't dissolved. So I'm going to take the pastry brush and again, a little bit of water is okay. That's just going to dissolve out. You don't want to add too much, but you can see that sugar starting to bubble. It's just starting to want to caramelize, which is great. So now, we're gonna add our bay leaf and cinnamon sticks. Now those are gonna get pulled out at the end, so don't worry about those being in there. Our crystallized ginger. Oh, there we go. Just like that. Now do be careful, you would never wanna taste this at this point. The sugar changes the temperature point, it, can, it will burn you. Sugar burns are the worst. So we're letting that mix in. Just like, see how that's changed? The consistency, the color, and it's beautiful. And now we're gonna add our chopped rhubarb. This was washed, chopped up. Now it looks like a lot for this pan. If you had a wider pan, definitely more surface area, the reduction would happen quicker. But we might have one done already to show you. Now again, I just wanna stir this in. Okay, whoops. Get that back in there. See how I'm folding it in? Now again, be really careful. The sugar at this point is very hot. Okay, it's not something you wanna taste now. And now we're gonna add our vinegar. And at this point, again, we talk about ventilation. When you add the vinegar, there's gonna be a little bit of steam. That vinegar is really strong, so you don't wanna inhale that. It could kind of cause you to cough up a little bit. So just add this in. And again, the idea of this is we're deglazing. Okay, referred to in other videos. If you've watched them, you know what we're talking about. And now I can turn the pan on high and I want to bring it to a boil. 
And again, one more time, if you look at the edge of the pan, we want to clean off all of the sugar spices on there because they'll just burn. So we just use our brush with our water. And remember, this water, it's just going to evaporate. So it's not, at the end of, it's not the end of the world to be adding a little extra water. And now this will take about maybe eight or 10 minutes to boil. And then we're going to simmer it for about a half hour, 40 minutes. And then the consistency will be there. The rhubarb would have broken down, but there'll still be a little texture in there. And then it'll be ready to be finished. Once it's boiled, we've wiped down the edges. We're going to turn the heat down and we're going to let it simmer. Simmering it for 30, 45 minutes, perhaps an hour. It's really about the size of the pan, the um, circumference of it. More surface area, it would reduce quicker. If it's a shallow pan, it's going to take longer to cook. So, and you do want to keep stirring it because the bottom will scorch, which you do not want. If that were to happen, let's say your pan scorches, you feel it's burnt, the best thing to do, don't stir it, don't do anything. Take the pan, get another pan, dump the contents of this pan into your new pan. Whatever is stuck in the pan, that scorch, don't use. Get rid of it because that's where you'll get the flavors transferred into the new pan, okay? So we're going to let this thing simmer 35, 40 minutes, even maybe an hour. And then once it's done, I prefer it cooled before we eat it. I think it tastes better cold for sure. And it's really good with cheeses, uh, grilled meats. Uh, I think you can even pair it with a pretty assertive piece of seafood. Bluefish would be incredible. So we're going to let it do its thing and we'll be back and we're going to finish the dish. Again here, this has been simmering for about 45 minutes to the hour or to an hour. Uh, again, we want to make sure we stir it, stir it, stir it. There's still a little bit of texture. A lot of the rhubarb has broken down. Now, again, we had mentioned that we make chutneys and we make compost with rhubarb primarily. A chutney generally contains vinegar, whereas a compote is generally just sugar with fruit. So those are basically the differences. Now, we decided to just put together a nice little grilled piece of our uh, ciabatta with some old Chatham Creamery uh, sheep's milk cheese and our chutney. So we're going to go and find some baby greens to use to garnish our cheese plate from the roof garden. And we're going to get back and we'll put this thing together. We've um, made our chutney. We've chilled our chutney. And now we need to eat our chutney. Uh, our bread is just finished grilling. I've turned off the pan. That way I don't burn it when I walk away because I could easily get distracted. We're going to go get a little bit of kale. And then I saw a nice little chive blossom over there that I want to pick to put on top of our cheese plate as well. So I'm just going to pick off a couple of leaves, just like this. I'm looking, I can take some of the outside leaves off. We don't need much, it's just a little garnish. See, you can barely hear those things screaming. Just like that. And now we're gonna go get over here I saw some chive blossoms just coming up, just here. So these things, the flowers have tremendous flavor. So we're just going to take that off like that. And then I'll show you, we're going to separate them. So we have the chive blossoms. Those have been over winter. They're coming back. They're flowering. So we're just going to pick the flowers off just like that. These are really good as a garnish. The flavor is really intense. You can drop them into soups. You can put them on bread, put them on top of pastas, even over a steak or pork chop grilled. They're delicious, just like that. So one thing that I've been taught to do when grilling bread is the idea of, of rubbing a raw garlic clove over the bread as it comes off of, it definitely should be grilled. I mean, you could bake it as long as it's nice and crusty because you want to be able to scrape a little bit of the garlic. And you can see some of the pieces of garlic will get stuck on the bread. And the heat from the bread actually slightly warms the garlic. I mean, you can really smell it. It takes that rawness off of the garlic. 
And now what we're going to do is we're just going to cut it into a few pieces. Just like that. We'll put that on our plate. Put this back here. And now this cheese ideally would be sitting at room temperature. And we're just going to take a few slices of this cheese, the beautiful sheep's milk cheese. And it helps too, if the knife is warm when you're cutting through this cheese, it helps rele release the cheese from the um, knife. We're gonna use a little bit of olive oil. So this is where you'd really wanna use extra virgin because we wanna taste the quality of the oil. Now we're gonna put a little bit of our chutney. Just a little, okay, just a little bit of the chutney. And you can see, see there's still some pieces of the rhubarb in there. It's great, so there's a little bit of texture in there. And now each one would get a nice little piece of kale. And then we'll just put a few of the flowers. And that's what we would do with our chutney some kale, chive, blossoms, beautifully grilled bread rubbed with garlic, and this is a perfect light lunch. Well, thank you for joining us on The Roof Cooking Rhubarb. I hope this inspires you to go to your local farmer's market, look for some rhubarb, give me a shout out in the comments section if you need help with recipes. Like I said, I got 120 pages worth of rhubarb recipes that I've never looked at. So it'll give me a good excuse to get into this book. And if you like what you see, please hit that subscribe button. Don't be like Eric, okay? Be a subscriber. Thank you. We can edit out Eric. Oh, the recipe will be. All right. Want me to do it again without Eric? All right. Okay, yeah. And where is that recipe found? No, I know, but how do I know? What do I tell people to look for? Look below? I say what? Below what? Okay. All right. If you'd like FedEx. I just <laughs> if you're interested in trying this recipe, you're gonna find it right below my feet. I think. No. No, oh, you find it below me. I don't know, that's what they said. Okay, for real. Yeah, whatever, I don't either. Okay, folks, if you want to try this recipe, look below. Someone types it there, and it's there. No? That's fine.